I have the privilege of interviewing Stuart today. He's a renowned and much respected actor in optics in the UK. And not only is he a genuinely nice man, he's one of the most knowledgeable people regarding optical businesses, which is why it's fitting that he's here today to share his experience with us. So hello, Stuart. Thank you for participating in Vision China 2023. Hello. So, we have called this session insights from a successful entrepreneur and um, let's get straight to it what skills do you think a good entrepreneur needs to have um thank you elaine and firstly thank you very much for the invitation it's a it's a privilege to speak to you today um okay um skills um passion i think is very important uh, to be passionate about uh, the work you you conduct and, and the passionate around your customers and uh, who you work with and suppliers um flexibility is is a, a good thing you have to be adaptable in in, in a changing marketplace um a highly uh, charged marketplace quite quite often um so yeah flexibility is important um thinking clearly under pressure i think when the pressure is on a lot of people make make mistakes, make silly judgments because of the amount of pressure they feel. And it's important to take a breath. I think it's important to try. Very few business problems need to be solved that very second, that very minute. Take your time, think clearly, um, even if it's um, often people say about sleeping on a problem. Um, have an overnight think and then when you wake up the next day, sometimes things become a lot clearer. So thinking clearly under pressure, understand you're under pressure and just take a little bit more time so you get the right decision. Um, that's uh, that's really important. I think a caring nature in, in business, um, certainly in terms of optical practices, they tend to be smaller, more family and orientated. We're not talking about major conglomerates. We're talking about a small, a small entrepreneurial business. And I think a caring nature for your team, for your suppliers, for your customers, for your patients. Uh, having that care is, I think, is hugely important in a, in, let's face it, a caring profession. Very important. Um, resilience. Um, if you have a business, uh, a number of years um, without question, a, a level of resilience is, is hugely important, I think. Um, and for me, uh, a good dollop of, uh, of OCD. Um, I think um, that fastidiousness around making things just perfect, just so, making sure that every little detail counts. You certainly see this in uh, in the sporting arena where they talk about marginal gains and these little, little areas could add up to make a difference. So having that real focus on on the little things to make sure your service, your product, your your demeanor, everything about what you do is comes over uh, well. So uh, understanding that. So yeah, there's a few a few things for you. I loved it when you said caring because I think that's that I think that's very important and I think our patients pick up on that as well. Um, but the one thing that you did mention was resilience and I, I often um, think of resilient be a resilient person as being quite hard skinned thick skinned and i'm not sure how they work together i think you think um, they can a, you? yeah i do I, I definitely do i mean i think a, a thick skin is, is required for if you like external problems so um i mean we've had covid19 what a, what a fantastic example of a of a, of a major uh, problem that the, the whole world has suffered so resilience to that not resilience to your team, not resilience to your patients. This is your caring comes in there. Your resilience is where external factors come in and, and put you under pressure with um, the competition or, or learning new skills or um, you know problems that arise through, um, well, a, a global pandemic, for example. So there, there's things that come on. And so that resilience you need to you need to have, um, you know, um, I think I think that's important. But the caring nature is is something that I think is is, is also uh, vital. So you 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 brought up the global pandemic. I, I'm I'm guessing that was a challenge for you and your business and your life. So uh, have you, that and maybe other challenges that you might have faced. You, would you like to give us a sort of an example of um, how yeah, you faced them? Absolutely. I mean, um, yeah. I, I, it, I think it's impossible to have uh, a business without facing some some major challenges along the way, and um, quite often how you face and um, how you face those challenges and how you meet those challenges really defines your business, um, not just then but later on down track. And um, I mean, the, the, we've had two major ones uh, in our in my lifetime in my career. 
um, and the banking crisis in 2008, um, again, a global problem, um, caused severe uh, problems in my business. My business dropped by 40%, uh, just shy of 40% in one year. Um, and um, yeah, supply of money. I, I lend money and there was no money to lend. It's a, it's a fundamental problem, uh, as you can imagine. Um, and we worked hard. I mean, I, I certainly made some mistakes through that. I mean, for me, and because our business shrank so much, I actually kept the same levels of staff that I had um, all the way through. And in truth, that was a mistake. I learned from that. Um, and this is one thing where, where you, you, you go along your business journey, learn from these mistakes. So um, we kept the same size of team. I should have made redundancies. I didn't. And for two or three or four years. Well, absolutely. And I cared too much. I cared for yeah. them and their families. Absolutely. But it actually it nearly our whole company nearly fell down because of that. You know, we kept our overhead was just too large for the for the volume of business that was coming in. And it was it was a naive thing. It was short sighted. I tried to do my best for everybody. And um, we, I mean, we scraped through, but but by the, the, the skin of our teeth, really. Um, but what we also did is um, it took us a few years to get to this place. Um, I think 2012 was the first time we we started lending our own money. So rather than using other banks to lend um, um, and we would just put them in touch as a broker um, with, with our, our clients, we actually started lending our own money. Um, and really, that has become a great success for us over over a, over a longer period of time. So sometimes you find through huge challenges, you actually find little things that actually take you to another level. And that certainly happened with 2008. Um, the other one has to be that the, the, the pandemic uh, COVID-19 again did did similar things. I mean, our, our business dropped probably 45 percent in one year. Um, and I learned from 2008. I made redundancies. I slimmed the, the team down. We came down from 22 employees down to 14. Very hard to do. People you care for, you know, their families. It's a tough thing to do. But we did that to, to effectively save the business and save the livelihoods of every of, of the employees that, that, that stayed. Um, but both of those things, they, they allowed us to lend more of our own money because um, the normal banking world was, was restricted in both cases. And we just started lending our own money in 2008 and then went a lot bigger in, in, in 2020 um, uh, in that regard. So both problems, uh, huge, huge problems. Yes, we, we, we uh, judge them slightly differently, but actually from that our business became so much stronger so quite often you find this i think in adversity you can find the opportunity um it doesn't it doesn't manifest itself on the same day <laughs> you have well, to think things, about it they're not the things you can plan for either really are they absolutely they kind of come left field and you you, you know you all... are very impactful uh, ab absolutely right and i think the other thing you find with or certainly i i have found is that um you don't know how much better your business can be until you're put under a lot of pressure. And this is this is from the left field. It really just catches you. It's a blind side. And so you have to think and think hard and change the way the business operates to allow it to to flourish. Um, and, it, and you need that something need. You probably prefer not to have that pressure, but under those circumstances. And that's really where then resilience comes in your ability to 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 think under those circumstances. Think clearly under those circumstances. Did you have a, a sort of a, a team of trusted allies or people that you could talk to, or were you very? Did you feel very much alone under that? You know, it's an um, entrepreneur alone. Well, I think That's this is something that, that absolutely. I mean, without question, when you are the majority shareholder of a business, you are you are a, a, alone, um, and your ability to cope with that. And I think certainly ECPs. Um, in the UK, certainly uh, feel very much like that. You know, you might run a practice in a in a small market town. You're worried about, um, you know, global players uh, as your competition who seem to know more than you do. And so that feeling of, uh, of being alone is 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 prevalent, is there. But you speak to friends, family, your colleagues. The lovely thing with with optics is you've generally been to university. You've got a, a cohort of, of similar minded people so you can draw on experience, whether they work in practice or in hospital or wherever. But you you've got these 
these friends that you can you can draw on and rely on and um you know i think certainly in my case you know i was i was fortunate to have people within my business that i trusted at highly um that i've known for many many years but also you know friends and family around as well and um you know you, you just draw on as much experience as you can that's good to hear um so we don't want to put people off setting up a business but what advice would you give those wishing to set up their own optical business is is there a magic formula for success or um I, if there is a magic formula it's, it's basically hard work uh, <laughs> i think um i don't think there is a magic formula for for success at all i think um f for me certainly if you're um Judging risk, I think, is a very big one. So if you're an employee, you work in a hospital or another uh, healthcare environment and you're thinking about taking that entrepreneurial step, it's a, it's a big step. Um, so write it down, get things written down, put down what you want to do. What do you want to achieve? Where do you want to go? What are the premise is going to look like? How many test rooms do you want? You know, what what market segment are you looking at? Are you looking at high end frames or, or middle of the road? Um, are you going to be highly healthcare orientated? Are you, you know, there's lots of things that start writing it down, building it, and then it builds um, clarity. It builds clarity of what you're trying to achieve. A cash flow forecast is, is, is a very big one to do. Hugely important to start putting down what the income's likely to be, what the costs are likely to be, you know, what the rent rates, you know, uh, bills are going to look like, how many dispenses then you need. You can start building this out and say, actually, yes, I can achieve this um, so by getting things down on paper huge because it, it gives you clarity it allows you to change things and it might be actually i don't want to do this i can see this is too much of a challenge i don't think i can make money in this environment i don't think i can make it work other times it can be exactly the opposite you know actually i think i can absolutely smash this i can do really well let's go for it and when you've got things written down you can start to see that plan and then that judgment of risk is a lot easier to make because you've got something in front of you. So yeah, that 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 planning stage, I think is, even if you're just sketching it out, you know, that I think it's very, very, very important. Very important. And there are lots of tools that you can use, like, you know, mind maps and SWOT analyses and mm. you know, force field analyses and all sorts of things you can get, you know, download off the internet to help you to, to do things like that. I, th I think so. There's, there's lots of tools around. Um, a, a lot of it comes from in here though. You know, you can use everybody else's tool, but what's in your heart? What's in your soul? What do you want to do? And do you want to make that? Do you want to make that leap? And quite often I find um, exactly the same scenario with three different people. You'll get three different answers. Some will go for it. Others will sit on the fence and others will just no, no, I'm very happy to stay where I am. So so you, it, it, there is a personal element. There's a huge personal element in, in, into that. And it's, um, it's good for them, isn't it? You know, hmm. You know, they might and they might decide they don't want to go it alone either. You know, they might they might want to, you know, uh, drive uh, a partner along with them. Well, so again, that, that, I think that's absolutely right. Again, when you start sketching things out, you can start to see, actually, I need some help here, be it financial or a skill set. You know, do I go into business with an, op, op, uh, an ophthalmologist or an optometrist or, or what do I want to do? So you, you start to, to, to find that. And quite often we see new starts as a partnership because they, they bring different skills that come to the party together. And then that gives you a little bit more strength. Um, there's a lot to be said for that. Um, you know, so, yeah, I think that's that's a fair, a fair point. So how would you advise people who may be frustrated with their corporate or their hospital life, but they're afraid to take a risk and open up their new business? Afraid is a strong word. Um, I think um, I think um, a lot of people get to a point of frustration um, or everybody feels frustration at a certain point in time. And quite often that frustration is where a lot of people stop. They don't enjoy their work environment. They're unhappy. And they stay at that point of frustration and they go home and they maybe complain or, or, or moan about that situation. They don't do anything about it. The point of frustration is, is telling you do something about it, get over it, get under it, go through it, find a way. So when people are frustrated in their work, you might then find you sketch something out and and actually owning a, a, your own business isn't right for you for whatever reason. But you've started a journey of finding a different way. 
so explore that journey use your brain to, to find that path that is better for you and that might be moving to a, a, a different career that doesn't mean practice ownership um, but it, it could well do and again I think by getting a cash flow written down getting a business plan written down you know maybe looking at premises and like, oh, I can see the business just just there you know you start to build this momentum and this confidence of, of what you can do and um, talk to people put talk to people that have done it you know draw on other people's experience I think one of the things is that during our training as optometrists or ophthalmologists or opticians we don't learn anything about business so it's actually quite daunting to we might be very good with people we might have very good clinical skills but it's 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 knowing how to take that step and who to trust and you know what what are the the flags that would tell us that we're going to be a success really you know yeah it's very different to difficult to judge that if you've never had any skills in that area i i think that's absolutely right and i think i think there's this um misnomer around um commerce and business is this whole different ball game that you know, i'm a clinician i don't know about it. It, it it's just making good judgments um you know do i want this kind of frame to buy or this kind of lens to use in the frames and and, and it's just a series of decision making that's really all, all it is and as you as clinicians you're making um decisions on refractions on eye health and these these are just decisions that that's really all, all they are um, but you're absolutely right there is no training and so it makes it sound more daunting um, it's the same in in uh, in dentistry in veterinary in in lots of other professions um, you know legal as well that there, there isn't really a, a commercial part of the qualification so it's left as this mythical thing it's a unicorn in a fairy garden it, 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 it it's actually a tangible thing and it, it, it's nothing to be scared of but just judge the risk write things down draw on people's experience you know that's that's where you can really you, you you're likely to know people that own their own practice speak to them find out what they found what you know, and they can give you oh speak to this guy who provides equipment this one that does finance this is the one that does lenses what and, and start pulling things together and 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 build trust and 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 find the trust in the people that you're working with. Good advice. Um, so employing and retaining staff, that's you know a big key to success, I guess. Very much how so. Would you, how, what would you advise for that? Uh, I I think um, staff, or we, we call them the team, really, uh, our family, our work family, are. Uh, the most important ingredient to all of this. You can have the best equipment, the best frames, the best lenses, but if you've got poor staff, the thing will, will fall before it starts. Very, very important that that, that patient journey is it excites and delights the, 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 the recipient. And a good team is, is absolutely vital for this. So employing and retaining is without question one of the most key parts to, to any entrepreneur's life. Um, so yeah, I would I would look at the skills you need as an entrepreneur, and we spoke spoke before about you know passion, flexibility, a caring nature. Um, these are the same skills that your team should have. You should all be aligned. You know you can't teach drive, enthusiasm. You can't teach them an ethical approach to business and a caring nature. These are very difficult skills to. To, to teach but you can teach an optometrist to refract you can teach a do to dispense you know those skills so it's not just the exam somebody has or the experience they have who are they as a person do they fit your your environment your personality and what you're trying to achieve with your with your business and so those core skills i think from a re, uh, a reten uh, a recruitment point of view is, is a great place to start i call it core skills i look for core skills and outside of the CV, I want to see what's in, in their heart and in their mind. Then in terms of retaining staff, very simple. Um, be nice, <laughs> be kind, <laughs> care about them, show you care, not just about them, but their family. I give everybody their birthday off as an extra day's holiday. So we have our holidays, but you always get your birthday off. And if your birthday is on a weekend, you can have the Friday or the Monday. Um, we have a summer a, a garden party where um, the staff come to my house and um, we put a bouncy castle up for the children and their families come and they spend the day with us and we cater for them, we look after them. And then the families mix, not just the staff. 
Um, I have share options with my team. So again, they're invested in the business. So if we ever have an event where we sell or a proportion of our business or, or we grow to another level, then they can enjoy the upside. And they're all engaged. I, I would say share your strategy um, with them. Um, that's another thing. So you might want a single practice that's in a centre of excellence. Share that with them. Show them the, the distance of the, where you want to go. Or you might want to grow to 10 or 15 practices, or you might want to build it to sell it. So whatever your strategy is, share it with your team. Let them come along your journey. Show them where you're going and, and, and let them be a part of that. Um, encourage them to learn and grow as well. You know, I think a lot of people, if you have people with the right skills, they want to grow in business. They don't want to do the same job over and over again. Try and help and encourage them. Quite often you'll be asked a question from a uh, from a team member. Don't just give them the answer. Ask them to think about what they think the answer is and then question them and, and see if they can validate, see if they can find the right path. And that that builds their confidence and builds their knowledge base and gets them thinking the same way you're thinking. So, yeah, just engage with the the, uh, the, the team. Um, and I think that's a great, great way of retaining people. I think I think stuff it appreciate as well, sort of being asked, what do you think? You know, because they do know the business and they know probably sort of nooks and crannies of the business that you might be a little bit sort of away well, from. There's 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 a few things that we employ at the at, uh, at performance finance here, and and one of them we we call a pop meeting, and and pop just P O P, um, and it, and it, and it um it stands for perfecting office procedures. So fundamentally, we're we're an office based business. We 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 lend money, um, so we don't have a, a an open house. We don't have customers coming off the street. So it's very admin orientated. And what we do with a pop meeting is we look at any problems or issues we've had over the past same month. And we look at those and and we say, what went wrong? Why did it go wrong? Never, ever, ever blame the person. Blame the process. Look at the process. Find out what you can do. And it might just mean that a second person has to check what's being done there or or you change the principle or you uh, adapt the software. There are different things you can do to make sure that process is is more resilient. Um, and then you document. And uh, at first, when you start the business, you will have a lot and you'll probably you might do a pop meeting once a week. I don't know, but you'll do it quite regularly. And then and then when you start the next pop meeting, you go through the minutes of your last one and you say, which processes have we changed? What did we do? Did it work? Um, and is it successful? Can we make it even better or has it knocked something else out here? In that case, oh, well, in that case, we've got to change this process. And by this continual development, you very, very quickly get to um, a level of excellence of service and your team come to you, as you said, about looking at the nooks and crannies. They know the inside. They can't wait then to, oh, Stuart, look, <laughs> I've got this problem. And and uh, and they come to you and they, they want to, to improve it. And then you've got everybody pulling in the same direction. And suddenly your team become much greater than the sum of the parts. It has that 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 real ability to generate more and drive forward. And, and you're helping each other. It's it, it, uh, it's a uh, uh, it brings a, a camaraderie for a team working together. It's it's a it's a it's a great little we uh, think it's a great little tool. I think that's a great thing to encourage having sort of an improvement loop in yes. your business to to be able to to pick up on things like that because it you know they say it's only for the the fact that a tiny screw could fall out of a big machine that that big machine can't function anymore you know and that tiny screw may be worth a couple of pence but you yeah, know yeah. it would it would uh, mess up. A whole big um, uh, process or, or, yeah, or investment. Um, let's talk about optical practices because you visit a lot of optical practices in the UK. What advice would you give to um, them overcoming problems and what are the common problems within optical practices that you see? Um, yeah, that's um, well in the UK. Um, I mean, with the independent markets, the, the smaller practices, um, I think the biggest problem that they face or they perceive is is the large multiples huge marketing budget on the television a lot um you know a low price point um quite often um a, a zero cost or a low cost for a, for a refraction so there's a lot of pressure there and, and it's a constant pressure um but when you're setting up your own business try not to compete with um people who are bigger and stronger on their ground 
find your own ground to compete with and that might be on service it might be on quality of product it, it could be on um, um uh, i don't know uh, all sorts of different things just the 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 experience you you get the the, the clinical excellence you provide um you know what can you do that, that's a step more than than you would get at a at a uh, if you like a low cost model so once you found those things that's the the the, the battleground for you and you promote those bits that's where you you provide difference uh, differentiation and i think then you can use that as your as, as your lever um and quite often you don't need the same volume of traffic as these these larger ones so you can you can spend more time with people you can have more dedicated uh, time to their their eye health uh, and the dispensing of good quality products so from that perspective you can find a different battleground and focus on that and stand for that um and don't don't try to compete you know I think spending time means that you get to know your patient better and getting to know them better you also get to know their needs better and mm. then you know you have the opportunity then to to provide them with products for all sorts of different you know areas in their life I mean so, yeah it, it might be different around the world but certainly in the UK um, we, we tend to find the independents take a take a, a more time and and provide um, they would say provide a better quality of service and and, and better clinic etc and i mean a good analogy would be um, international flights where um, most people will, will, will pay for an economy ticket to fly from one place to another but the same plane going to the same destination um, traveling at the same time there are people paying for business class and first class flights that and they are they see the differentiation there and they and they were happy to pay a good premium for it and if you're looking to do then find what your business class is find what your first class is and and get that as your patient base not the other side uh, which is more mass produced so a mass produced product does work well for the masses but that means there's a whole cohort of, of people that don't want to go through that experience they don't want a cheap experience they want to have something a bit uh, a, a bit different uh, and a bit more luxurious so find your business class find your first class that's a real really nice analogy because it's you know some something you can hang your hat on really um so we've had the global pandemic we've put, talked about that and we've got a cost of living crisis today um certainly in the uk and around the world as well there's uncertainty uncertainty in different markets because of political instability around the world so when would you think is a good time to start investing in a business or either a new one or an established one which needs to upgrade um, do we put it off what happens? yeah i think um when is a good time to invest that's a really that's a if you're talking about investing uh, financially, um, I think if you've got an existing practice, then then really the, the door's always open because irrespective of a marketplace, if there's new technology that comes along that you need, that require that, that gives you a, 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 um, a USP, then that's that's uh, that's worth exploring. So, you know, certainly at the moment we've we've seen a, a quite a, a growth in dry eye and myopia management. Um, a few years ago was OCT, and I would argue an investment into an OCT when the market is more flat was still a worthwhile investment because it generates income, it raises the level uh, diagnostically and clinically of your practice. So actually, um, and quite often most people will fight shy of that so even more reason to invest because you're alone there's less competition at that time and if you can generate income from it and it works then then, then that's that's the way forward so actually sometimes uh, when when there's more recessionary times along and times are tighter if the right technology comes along you can add a different service and provide more income to the exact same patient base you've got even if the patient base is, is shrinking hopefully it's not but you know you can still um, find a new income stream so I think in terms of investing financially, that that is always open and you shouldn't be mindful of what new technology uh, is, is around the corner. Um, in terms of investing in general, you can invest in. Investing is really about improving. Um, so whether it's coaching or training for you or your team, uh, whether it's in new ranges of product, be it eyewear or lenses or or marketing. And, and certainly if you've got new technology, you need to get the message out there uh, of what you're doing. So so investing is 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 a way of continually improving. 
And so if you if you look at investment as a wider angle of what it really means, I mean, every week you, 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 you need some time just to consider how can I do this better? How can we improve? Because that continual journey will allow you to grow. Absolutely. You mentioned OCT there. And I know um, you could be sort of faced with, you know, looking at these things at different optical shows and you see an OCT and it's got a ticket of £30,000 and you think, oh, my God, I've not got £30,000. It's going to take me years to to be able to claw that back. Um, what's your feeling on that? You need to send them to me <laughs> <laughs> because I we, we have tools that will show that if you charge a patient, £35 for an OCT scan and you see three patients a day uh, on three or four or five days a week, then, then it will generate an income. In fact, an OCT on a five day test week at the kind of cost you're talking about, say a £35 charge for, for a scan, uh, less than one patient a day would, would, would actually pay for the machine. And so when you see two or three or four patients a day that have a scan, you're suddenly making you know, good profits and depending on the volume and the charge will depend. And we have a tool that we have on a, on a phone um, that will just do to push the numbers in and you can see. And what that does actually, it's really quite good for judging how much do I charge? If I charge more, I'll have less patients. If I charge less, then I'll see more patients. Where, where does that return maximize? Um, you know, to the point where you say, well, I'm just gonna put my whole site test up by 10 pounds and everybody has an OCT, that's my standard of care, that's what I'm doing. And then suddenly that's maybe 10 patients a day rather than um, you know, two or three on, a, on an uplift conversion. But you can play with these numbers and that's what really we do. That's really the heart of, of really performance finance and our ability to, to show that these things can work. You know, and we're seeing this in dry eye uh, treatments at the moment, you know, with, with different diagnostic tools and sorry, treatment tools um, in, in that where we can, uh, there's a chargeable service for that. So we can very quickly show a return uh, and what that does. So yeah, an OCT is, a, is an interesting model because yeah, the ticket price is quite, I will watering for a lot of people, but actually you can very quickly um, turn that into when do you want to start making 30, 40, 50,000 pounds a year? Because this is what this machine does for you with your patient base, with your demographic, with your practice. And, that, and that's just talking numbers. It's not talking the sort of the professionalism and the word of mouth and other things that come with, you know, investing in professionalism, you know, in professional tools and, and things to help you, Absolutely. you know, serve patients better. Yeah, I mean, I come very much from a commercial angle, of course, but the clinical uplift of a practice is great. I mean, just to be able to refer uh, a, a patient to an ophthalmologist and save someone's sight or catch ARMD early um, or something like this. This is these are these are great clinical uplifts, not just for your practice, but for your actual patients. You know, you could be saving someone's sight here. You know, it's a, it's a huge uplift. And if you if you can do that, then then that that's a that's a wonderful place to be. Absolutely. So we haven't got much time left. I've got a couple more questions for you before we before we go. Um, so what have you or your company done really to help opticians to to invest in their businesses to make that leap? Yeah, I think um, quite quite a lot, really. I mean, from our perspective, those tools that we talked about in terms of return on investment are fantastic. Um, for new starts, we help them build business plans and cash flow forecasts so we can help them make that journey when they're they're. they're um, you know, less confident about business at the beginning. So we try and give them the tools. You can go onto our website and download a lot of information. Um, we give great advice in terms of in the UK, VAT um, is uh, is, a, is a retail tax that, that often is lost on investment, but we can get that back for practices. So there's 20 percent um, of their costings that we, we would hope to get back for them. Um, we make our funding tax efficient for them as well. Um, and of course, we're competitive and give them flexible terms and this kind of thing. Um, and then on top of that, credit approvals are really slim, um, a, a very quick, very fast, very easy and, and not too intrusive. Um, so I don't know what the banking sector is like in around the world, but certainly in the UK, it can be a, quite a challenge to to go through the, the rigmarole of, of getting credit approvals, answering a lot of questions and, and people not really understanding what you do. We understand optics. We understand a, a, a dispensing optician and, and, and an ophthalmologist an optometrist. We understand what it takes to, to, to make a practice work commercially. We understand, you know, you know, a, a lot within a within the business of a, of, of a practice. So we're and we're confident in, in um, our abilities to lend to the right people at the right time, making it easy for them. Um, 
and giving them the best chance of success, starting them off on the right path. I'm going to put you on the spot now. Um, what do you think the practice of the future will be like in five to ten years' time? Um, yeah, very good question. Um, I mean, really, the advent of technologies is uh, is undeniable and continues at a, at a, at a pace. Um, we're 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 pretty much at the time where I think refraction is 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 almost lost to a machine. Uh, there's no there's no question that some refractions are are an art more than a science, um, and will need human intervention. But I think a lot of standard refractions can be done by a machine. You're then into the area of you know offloading refraction. Um, to, to a machine predominantly, um, potentially into remote refraction. I don't think we're a million miles away from going to a to a refraction cafe and having a coffee, having a, a, a site test within a within a coffee house, and and maybe even be able to pick spectacles and have them delivered to you that day, the next day, uh, like an Amazon kind of scenario through a through a through a smart mirror. Um, I even think, I mean, Apple and Android. Uh, uh, are definitely working hard on on the optics of these things, and and I don't think it's beyond the possibility of of um, of, of refraction off of, off an iPhone. Um, so yeah, a very dynamic world ahead, um, and uh, we will have to adapt to 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 these changes. I think there'll always be, well. I think I think the clinical side of, of optics will will, will march forward as well. I mean, I think what we'll I think we'll see a change in patient and customer perception of where a, an, an, op, uh, an optician was somewhere just to get spectacles um, or contact lenses and I think we'll see their perception realizing that the, the health of the eye is, is a window to a lot of the, the body health so it isn't just about you know cataracts and glaucoma and and this there's a lot more going on uh, behind the scenes which we can get from the eye and I think we could see practices become far more important in that in the in the health of the eye and the body and the, the patient perception of that could, could change dramatically particularly if they're into a, what could be a quite a commoditized refraction and dispensing scenario um, um, but I still think there's plenty of room for people to try on frames and you, you get that love, don't you, from 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 touching them and seeing them and then what outfit you're wearing and how they make you feel. And, and you're going to struggle to do that, I think, with um, with computers and online. So there's still a, you know, a, a home for that without without question. We've just got a lot going on and we'll see how that 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 develops. But um, certainly I think that, that that level of technology lift will be will be quite fast. Um, and we, we should see some things there. It's all about the adaptability, isn't it? Again, you know, that we're Absolutely. going to have a job if we're adaptable and, you know, we're going to be able to have our businesses and see patients and, mm. and, yeah, uh, yeah. and be successful. It, and there will be optical entrepreneurs. Absolutely. It's hard to see, even, even with the technology, how um, dry eye management, myopia control, you know, can can be done with with these sort of things. So there's there's things within within that um, that that you can see that that clinical side is still going to be very very prevalent. And and of course, you know, what what person doesn't look like doesn't like to look very good in their in their spectacles as well. So there's still room for that personal service. And again, this comes kind of back to the business class and first class flight, um, providing that for your for your patients is uh, it's a wonderful place to be. I think. Well, Stuart, thank you so much for joining us today at Vision China. Um, thank you very much. We, I hope to uh, see you in the future. And uh, to all the people who are listening in um, the room today, uh, I'd just like to say shishi dajia. Thank you very much, Elaine. Thank you.